Across the fence, we'll get an up-close look at who and what is living in Vermont. From the common to the uncommon, scientists are looking high and low to document every living thing in Vermont, and they need your help. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Scientists at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies in Norwich are spearheading a fascinating and ambitious project. It's called the Vermont Atlas of Life. Across the fence is Rebecca Gollin tells us more. I'm going to watch this for a second. It's already uploaded and it just says on the database, I saw something and it's the picture of it. Let's see if Ken McFarland has, has seen this plant before, but the name is not coming to mind. To get some help identifying it, McFarland posted a couple of pictures to a database online called iNaturalist. There, several hundred amateur and professional naturalists from around the state and beyond can offer their opinions. He doesn't have to wait very long. Just a few seconds later, and he has an answer. So, one of the guys already answered me, Kyle Jones, is on the site. He says, it's poison parsnip. Uh, you were right, it's poison parsnip. Which McFarland and his colleague Chris Rimmer are conservation biologists with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, or VCE. They're demonstrating the crowdsourcing capabilities that support one of their biggest projects. The goal of the Vermont House of Life is to map out every living thing in Vermont and where it is. Wait, everything? Everything from fungus and lichens to, you know, birds flying over your head. I suppose if you're really into it, we could get into soil bacteria. A lot of bees here. That's why it's called the Vermont know. Atlas of Life. They really do mean everything. Oh, there's a honeybee. Yeah. VCE has produced several comprehensive studies of different species in Vermont. Most recently, a revised edition of a breeding bird atlas, as well as a complete survey of the state's butterflies. Hundreds of volunteers work with the group to collect data and information on a wide variety of species. There's a tremendous diversity of people that are involved in our projects. Of course, many of them are interested naturalists, um, not just birders, because we're working on amphibians, we're working on bumblebees, we've worked on butterflies. So anybody with an interest in any aspect of natural history and wildlife is, is a candidate. And um, yeah, we've got people in their 80s and we've got people in their teens that are out there collecting data for us. The Atlas of Life won't be live online for a few more months. For now, contributors post their observations and photos to one of the associated databases, which will feed their information into the Atlas. Although VCE does have some projects that require special training, anyone who wants to can play a part. You could take a picture of something while you're hiking of a tree, a leaf of a tree. Say, you know, I think this is some kind of oak, but I'm not sure. And you could post it on there and, and you could just say, Here's a tree I saw, here's where I saw it, here's what it looks like because the photo's on there. Somebody help me out, what is this tree? And there's so many naturalists on there now that someone will see it and they'll say, oh, that's actually a white oak. That's pretty uncommon in that part of Vermont. Do you think it was planted or is it natural? And there'll be a little conversation will ensue and some others might jump in on the conversation about that species. And so not only are you providing a record of that tree in that place at that time, but you're also able to learn um, a little bit more about that species, a little bit more how to identify them just from everyone else joining in and helping you. The observations add up. Vermont eBird, where bird watchers can contribute their sightings, has over a million records, with more being added every day. These folks are feeding us information that we could never collect on our own on a large landscape scale. And at the same time, they're learning a great deal. They're becoming engaged in, in science and conservation on their own. They're becoming more informed stewards. They're becoming ambassadors for wildlife conservation in their own communities. So it's really a, a tremendous um, two-way street. I have about 2,500 on the iNaturalist observations and uh, about two-thirds of those are actually Vermont. So Roy Pilcher is one of those volunteers. Raised in Africa, Pilcher came to Vermont in the mid-60s, 
already an avid birder. And there's nothing like putting you in the moment when you're watching birds. I mean, the rest of the world really doesn't exist. When you've got your binocular on a warbler and you're trying to identify it or you're trying to uh, watch its behavior or see where it's nesting, re really the rest of the world doesn't exist. It's really, you, you connect yourself to something that's living and it's completely involving and uh, just takes you over completely. When Pilcher came to Vermont, he had to transfer his knowledge of African birds to the American birds he was now observing. What I did right away, I kept field notebooks, and luckily I had pretty good records, so when all this information became digitized with eBird, eButterfly, and iNaturalist, I had a lot of information which I was able to transfer. Another big thing you can do is you can explore data. So you can actually go on here and map out where birds are in Vermont and beyond. So maybe you want to know, hey, where are the state, where's the state bird been seen lately? Hermit thrush. You can go on here, type in hermit thrush, and get an instant up-to-date map of where all the hermit thrush sightings have been. When the Vermont Atlas of Life is fully up and running, it will be an online clearinghouse of information for students, educators, naturalists, and others, as well as a place to share their own observations. Whether you're tracking In addition, or as people online, around the state contribute their real-time findings and long-time naturalists like Pilcher add their data, the scientists at the VCE will gain a clearer idea of what changes are taking place in Vermont. As time marches on, are things changing? Are um, red oak trees moving further north? Are white pines moving and sugar maples moving higher in elevation? Um, are birds changing the date they arrive? Are butterflies changing their flight times? I mean, this phenology, this timing of things is really important, and that's only by observing it over and over and over every year. So even putting in every single you know, monarch butterfly you see in there helps solve that phenology, that timing issue. Is it changing? So it, it never is gonna end. That's good news for Pilcher. I enjoy collecting data, I enjoy entering it. Uh, both for the actual experience of the time, but the fact that that data is going to be used you know, down the centuries. Literally anybody can contribute a piece to help us put the puzzle together of biodiversity conservation in Vermont. And that's the beautiful thing about this. The Vermont Atlas of Life might never be finished, but the information it will provide will soon be helping to protect the state and everything that lives here. In White River Junction, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Well, thanks, Rebecca. Joining me now is Vermont Center for Eco Studies wildlife biologist Kent McFarlane. Thanks so much for being with us. This is such a great idea. How did you get this idea to do this? Well, I came up with it um, working with some other biologists. I realized that um, in talking with them, especially the insect folks, that we actually didn't know all the species ex even existed in the state let alone where they were. You know, we think about places like uh, Guatemala or these exotic places where we're discovering new species. Well, we're discovering new species and new things here in Vermont all the time, and I wanted a place where I could go as a person and just see what we know is here and what we don't know is here. Mm -hmm. So what's the goal? The real goal is um, a, a couple of things. One is, is to have a place where you can go and learn anything you want to know about the biodiversity of Vermont. You can get up to date on where things are. Um, sort of an educational portal. The other goal is for conservation. There's a lot of changes happening um, each year in the state, and we want to know are those changes good or bad for our biodiversity, and this is a place where we can all contribute to that. So we don't really know then how many species of plants and animals are in Vermont, or do we? No, we actually don't. I mean, some of the stuff, the charismatic things like birds, we have a really nice grip on birds. We know there's over 300 species have been in Vermont before. Uh, mammals were over 50 species. You know, those, those kind of things, we have a pretty good idea of what's here. Um, but when you get down to things like plants and then insects, with insects, there's a lot of things we don't know. We I just may not guess. want to know. <laughs> yeah, we, you may not want to know. Some of them are creepy crawlies, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's just guesses with some of that stuff. And so we're thinking there's somewhere between 26,000 and 48,000 living things, not including singular cell things like, you know, soil microbes, mm -hmm. living in Vermont. It's a lot. And so the Atlas of Life has a lot of different projects under its umbrella, too. One that caught my attention was the second Vermont breeding bird atlas. Yeah, it, 
years ago in the late 70s, the first breeding bird atlas was launched in the state, used hundreds of bird watching volunteers, one of the first of its kind in North America, to figure out just what birds were actually breeding in Vermont. We didn't really know. Um, and 25 years later, um, in 2007, we finished um, The Breeding Birds of Vermont, the second edition. Mm -hmm. And here's the book that's out now. And it was another huge effort with hundreds of volunteers, part of the Vermont Atlas of Life, to figure out what changes have happened with the bird population since the 70s. And there's been some drastic changes. Thanks to citizen scientists, we were able to collect all that data. Why is it important to have the data? Why is it important to, well, to know how many birds or, or critters are in Vermont? Well, there's a couple things. One of them, it's sort of a sign of, of the health of, of our environment in Vermont. It's a place we're really proud of. Um, and that's sort of a, an important thing for that. But it also is just the feeling of, you know, taking care of, this, the, of the things that live here that we share Vermont with, too, and having an appreciation for those. A lot of us are hikers, bikers, we're outdoors people here in Vermont, and to have that you know, biodiversity around us, I think, is a real treasure in Vermont. So another project that a lot of volunteer citizen scientists helped with was the Vermont Butterfly Survey. Yeah, just like the Bird Atlas, we had hundreds of volunteers um, a few years ago go out with us for seven years across the whole state trying to understand what butterfly species we had here. And, you know, people know of the state butterfly, the monarch, and mm -hmm. things like that, but there turns out there's 105 species of butterflies that make their home in Vermont. Twelve new species we found for the state of Vermont in that time. Um, and so now we have a real good understanding of what's rare, what isn't rare, what's you know around in different parts of Vermont. We're able to do some conservation of those things and have a better appreciation for them. And also it can point out to red flags if, if some species aren't doing well. Absolutely. There's a few species that haven't been doing well, uh, mostly wetland species, so it's something we can target. Mm -hmm. And anyone can help with these efforts. What are some of the ways that people can join in? Well, we have some really neat crowdsourced databases. You can go right online. Um, um, you can use your smartphone to collect data. It's a really great uh, tool, but you don't even have to have a smartphone. You can just use a camera. You can go on our webpage at vtecostudies.org. You can get to our iNaturalist project that we talked about. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't have to be a professional or an expert naturalist. You can just be out there hiking, taking pictures of things that you're um, discovering, things that you're finding in your explorations. Post them on those sites, and hundreds of naturalists in Vermont will help you identify them if you don't know that, that ID. And they all go in our database to help us understand the biodiversity of Vermont. You just have to be someone who's curious. You have to have a degree in curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> you also have something that you call the Phoenix Project. What's that all about? Well, that's an idea we had of all this data in Vermont that's historic. Um, goes back 150 years of data, actually. That's in museums at UVM, for example. It's in naturalist notebooks. Um, and all that stuff, if it's not in a database, we can't use it as biologists and scientists. We need to have it in databases where you can number crunch it. So the idea of the Phoenix Project, and one of the projects we're doing right now, is, is taking 30 years of bird data from the 1970s on up that are in notebooks. We've scanned all the notebooks and put it online, and you can actually go in there and help us enter the data into a database. It's sort of, uh, the reason we call it the Phoenix Project is it's sort of the old data rising up out of the ashes so mm -hmm. we can use it again. And we're trying to reclaim that historic data so we can compare it to the conditions today and into the future and learn how things have changed with biodiversity in Vermont. And so you're actually looking to retrieve past bird sightings. Absolutely. We've um, we've had people donate old notebooks they found in their attics from their grandfather or their grandmother, for example, with historic, really valuable historic data that we're able to then bring into databases and use. So that's important to you. This, people's personal notes on what they've been seeing over the years is important. Absolutely. I've had people contact me who have found old notebooks that were their grandmothers, like I said, or their mothers that had 30, 40 years of bird sightings in it. We can make that digital and make that useful now and into the future. We're really interested in that historic data. So for my old field guide, wherever I, I see something new or I write down the date that I saw the bird, that would be important? Absolutely. We'd love you to log into <laughs> iNaturalist and put that data right into our database. Um, if people want more information, what should they do? You can either give the call at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, or better yet, you can visit our webpage, vermontecostudies.org. Um, VTEcostudies.org is the web page. Mm -hmm. And on there you can connect with um, our Atlas of Life. We have lots of different projects um, for everyone and just start discovering life in Vermont. And this strikes me as a project that really probably won't have an end. No, fortunately for me, I think this job <laughs> is going to go for a long time. It really won't have an end. It's going to take us 
you know, maybe a long time to ever, ever map everything out and find everything in Vermont. We'll probably never have that end. Um, but that's part of the fun. It's part of the discovery. But surely we'll have many interesting discoveries um, in the days ahead and years ahead for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fun that anybody can take part in that too and help. Anybody. It's anybody from young children to retired adults. Anybody can take part in this. And that's the best and joyous part of it. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming in and talking about this. Thanks. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.